everyone. Today is a long day. Um, I will try not to get it over five, but I did run, I think, four minutes over um, for the Monday class. So if you need to go pick up kids or do something, I get it. You need to go just uh, finish up the uh, lecture with the recording because, you know, the recordings will be posted tomorrow. So you never lose anything. So exam number one, this class, everybody passed. Everybody passed. You know, and I was asking some of the students that were earlier, what did you study? And the answer was the cahoots helped with the concepts that are there. If you knew what those concepts were, knew how to apply them, you did very well. Also the review, the review has everything in it. Now, I'll tell you about that review. It not only covers what you need to know for the exams, but it also is gonna help you in your HESI, hint. It also is gonna help you when you go to your NCLEX. If, and they are starting to put a lot more pediatric questions on your NCLEX now. So it is a great review. So save what you have to be able to go over it. You know, and me putting it on YouTube, my information, it's gonna last there because Zoom recordings do get um, edited and they're deleted after like 30 days now because there's so much Zoom going on today in the community because of COVID. So that YouTube channel will always be there. It's public, you can always get to it. So it's for you. So congratulations on that exam. I'm glad that what I'm doing is helping you and helping you understand. Um, this week, we will be doing respiratory and cardiac and it is a rough week of understanding. Um, the respiratory, very similar would it be to adults in many of uh, the things that I'll talk about. But cardiac is different, except for congestive heart failure. Everything else, the congenital heart defects, you don't see as much in adults. Um, and usually when they are adults, they've already been corrected or they've gotten a transplant by that point. You have a discussion question that's due this week. I did send out some messages today for those who hadn't got it in yet. It's okay. You have the whole week. I mean, it says in by Wednesday, 11.59. Um, but as long as you're in by Sunday, I'm okay with that. And you have quiz three. Uh, quiz three is on respiratory and on cardiac. So I hopefully will be going over uh, those questions that can help you. Any questions so far? You do have two case studies. Make sure they're done also by Sunday, okay? You have cystic fibrosis and you do have um, the congenital heart. Babe. It's okay, Brandy, I got you. <laughs> it's okay. Calling her somebody a babe. Okay. I do the same thing. <laughs> hey, babe, how you doing today? So let's go from right to our PowerPoint. Let's get her done. And we're going to start with respiratory. Now, understanding children, adults, it doesn't matter. We have upper respiratory and we have lower respiratory. Now in children, the thing with them is because of these big tonsils, these big adenoids, the mucus can't go down you know, the track and you can't get rid of them as easily, especially if you're really small babies. So you're gonna hear a lot of upper respiratory sounds. There are a lot of mucus up, up in the upper airway, but because the chest is so close, you're gonna have a lot of those sounds referred. So it's understanding how to listen to the upper airway, making sure it's mucus and not like ronchi or rails in the lungs. Um, the upper airway is usually an upper respiratory infection. Um, could be ear infections, it could be a throat infections. Um, most of the upper airways are viral, the coughing type of things, but we know the ears, you know, sinuses, um, those are going to be a bacteria which we'll treat with antibiotics. And of course, your strep throat. The lower um, respiratory is usually your pneumonias. And it could be one lobe, it could be multiple lobes, one side, two sides, it doesn't matter. Pneumonia is a, it's a consolidation of an area of the lungs. Usually left lower 
it's a big one. I've seen a lot of those pneumonias, but I've seen right and left lower pneumonias. And when you listen to this chest, you will hear decreased sounds. I used to love to hear the symptoms that came in from these children in the ER. And they were saying they had a cough. They had a fever of 101 to 102, because that's the magic number that I have seen. It's not in a book. It's just what I have seen. And then you will see them that they vomited in lack of appetite. I'm going, this sounds like pneumonia, especially that temperature. Um, I love to listen to the chest and find out where do I think that pneumonia is? And then when the chest x-ray comes back, I like to look, say, hey, I was right. So we know most of these infections are viral, like I've told you, but we do have some strep and we do have some ear infections, et cetera. Um, but mostly cough, cold, fever, they're gonna send you home, Tylenol and Motrin. Now, when infants are born, mom gives all the antibiotics to the baby and it protects them somewhat. But that's why if you've noticed that two page you know, thing in your book, on immunizations, it seems like overwhelming, doesn't it? It's like a lot of immunizations that are required, but why? Well, mom's you know, antibodies are gonna go away. And that child then will have to fend on itself as a newborn or very young infant. So that's why we give two, four, six months. Um, and we try to cover those diseases which can really be harmful. So um, that's the reason for these immunizations being given so quick. So. At birth, you shouldn't see a sick baby for the first three months. And if you do, that child is sick. And those children will be treated usually in high alert um, and moved to a, like in the ER or anywhere, they'll be seen first because they are sick because there's no defense. We gotta work quick for them. Three to six months, we're gonna start to see them get a little bit more sicker. Um, these children at this time are going back to daycare, you know, um, you're getting more lenient with people picking up the baby, your friends, you know, neighbors, et cetera. So that infection's going around. When your child gets to be a toddler, and remember this is the age of swapping spit, as I call it, everything in their mouth, go to daycare, in their mouth, you put them on, you know, the shopping cart and they go right down to the, the rail and start sucking and biting on it. I mean, these kids just love everything in their mouth and they're swapping these germs. And these kids, this is why they're sick. But why is this a good thing? What's their body doing? It's building antibodies, right? So by the time they get to go into kindergarten, they hopefully have gotten a lot of these diseases, a lot of these viruses, built up defenses, and now they're not gonna get sick as much. So at this point, most of it you will see is now your strep, your pneumonias, you know, more bacterial type of infections. And as, as you see, as I went along, the immunity for children increases with age because of exposure. Like I said, their diameters are really small, short, and open. And because of this, we get a lot of ear infections in children. And children, they will tell you their ear hurts and they'll point to their ear. Even little young little two-year-olds will say, which ear hurts? And they will point to you. Usually they'll take the hand and go to the other side. And I just think it's so cute. I just wanna hug these kids because I know how much it hurts. Remember your priority here is pain control. Right? These kids are giving some Tylenol or Motrin. Now, what will you see with a kid not feeling well? Well, usually the first thing you will see is all of a sudden they get this fever and you don't notice the fever yet. What you notice is they are putting their head down in the middle of the day or they're not eating, they're not drinking their favorite foods, favorite juices, something's wrong. And at that point, you'll touch the kid, find the fever and of course, medicate them. What's great about children though, once you medicate them with fever, get their fever down, what do they do? They start drinking, eating, playing and acting normal. So what is the goal? Keep those fevers down as much as possible. Usually you'll see fever and headaches. You'll see them not eating. And then of course you'll have the GI, vomiting, diarrhea, um, abdominal pain. You might see that cough, sore throat, all this mucus in their nose. You know, and you might even hear that those lung sounds are getting full of sounds. And it, a lot of times, it's, again, is that upper respiratory. So our goal is, of course, reducing that fever's number one. Because what does that do? 
it promotes rest, okay? They're gonna rest easier. They're gonna eat, they're gonna drink, you know? Um, and we need, of course, that fluid because they're losing so much insensible fluid loss just because of a fever. So getting that, um, just even just getting the hydration in is important. And, you know, we try to reduce that spread of infection, but you know, kids, they're still gonna be all over everything in their mouth. So how do we take care of an ear infection? Well, pharmacologically, the kid's gonna tell you, okay, they're first gonna tell you the ear hurts and you're gonna say, okay, if you wanna look in there and see a bulging eardrum, you can, or the physician comes and says, yep, it's an ear infection. The first thing we're gonna do is give them something for pain because it hurts. You know, and that's the biggest complaint with these children is the pain. And then we're going to start antibiotics. And the important thing is to tell those parents to finish the whole course of antibiotics, not to give half the dose to the other kid who also has an ear infection, because you only could afford one kid to go in to the doctor's office, you know, so we didn't have $20 twice. So let's just split it. And then this kid's going to get an ear infection and another ear infection. You never really cure it. Now, what if this kid has been getting what he's supposed to, all the antibiotics, and he's constantly getting ear infections, four or five a year? At that point, they'll consider putting tubes in. And usually with the tubes, they're probably going to do tonsillectomy, adenoidectomy, to clear the airway, to make sure that mucus can pass easier so that it doesn't go up into their ears. And again, we know pain is the big thing. Now, mononucleosis, very misunderstood. Mononucleosis is the kissing disease. That's what we all know it as. You got mono, it's the kissing disease. Who did you kiss? It is a herpes-like Epstein virus, okay? So it's a viral infection. So you're like, oh, it's just a virus. Well, it's tired, fever, and sore throat. And then you ache and pain everywhere and you'll see lymph nodes that are swollen. Now, the biggest concern is when the liver or spleen or both get inflamed. So you've got this, let's say spleen blows up like a basketball. Okay. It's all inflamed. The biggest concern about a child with mononucleosis is to protect that abdomen. Now I'm going to give you a story about infectious mononucleosis and how a young nine-year-old boy ended up into my ER room twice. So first he went to the doctor complain of fever, fatigue, sore throat. He did a swab, it wasn't strapped, he didn't have the flu. So they sent him home, Tylenol, Motrin, increased fluids, okay? Five days later, still wasn't doing well. Went back to the doctor, they said, oh, well, let's just put it on antibiotics because maybe that will work. Oh, another couple of days went and he still wasn't well, came to my ER room. So with a complaint of fever, fatigue, and sore throat, aches and pains, we said, well, let's do some labs. Well, we wanted to see the CDC. We wanted to see if the white cake count was elevated, but we also did a mono spot test because of this sore throat that wasn't going away with the fever. Well, this child's mono spot test came back positive. So we did intense teaching, the physician and me. It was this nine-year-old boy with his father came in, explained, you need to have this child, no PE in school for at least three weeks, and that must be cleared by the pediatrician before he's allowed to go back to sports at all. You need to protect the belly. Do not let the children, you know, rough housing at home, you know, kids like to wrestle and whatnot. No, protect the belly because the spleen is fragile and could burst. One week later, I am now primary trauma nurse and we get a call by rescue. Nine-year-old boy was on a trike, fell off, landed on his belly. He died in transit to coming to us because his spleen ruptured. This was the boy who was diagnosed with mono. The parents or father let him get in a trike one week later and the kid died. So mono is not as a kissing disease as you think, okay? So just remember that big, big nursing is that please tell them to restrict exercise, protect that belly and keep the brothers and sisters off of them. Now, our upper respiratory condition that we can talk about is croup. 
And croup could be anywhere from a barking sound all the way up to something called epiglottitis. So croup, you're gonna hear a barking seal. It is very loud, very distinctive. It is a swelling inflammation of the upper airway and you hear this bark and they cough and cough and cough. Usually croup and even your bronchitis are seen more at night. And it's this dry cough. There's no mucus, it's just a dry cough. You may or may not even see a fever. Either you might or might not, it's just, you don't know. But if it gets to the point of this coughing going on and on and you don't treat it, this child could go into an epiglottitis. Now, what is the epiglottis? The epiglottis is that leaf-like structure that covers the trachea when you swallow so that food doesn't go into your lungs. Well, this flap swells, covers the trachea. So guess what? You can't breathe. So these children are just like those old people, COPD, bent over, trying to find a way that air can get in there, okay? So you can hear severe inspiratory strider. You, this child can't swallow because this epiglottis is so swollen. So they're drooling like crazy. Now, what is treatment for epiglottitis? Well, the one thing that the physician will do is they'll look in the back of the throat. Nobody else should do that, okay? Unless you are skilled to do a tracheostomy or to intubate. And usually because of the swelling, you cannot get an ET tube down into that trachea because of that swelling. So usually it's a tracheostomy. Thank goodness I've never gotten to that point, although I've seen epiglottitis in its severe form. So what do we do for epiglottitis? Well, we need to decrease the swelling. So let them be in a position where they're comfortable. I don't care if it's on the mother's lap. I, it doesn't matter as long as they're quiet, comfortable, because they're restless. They're getting hypoxic, right? So put them in the parent's lap, get them on the monitor, an O2 sat, and we're going to be given racemic epi aerosols. And that epinephrine goes directly on the back of the throat, decreases the swelling. We'll be getting an IV in and we'll be giving some steroids. Nothing by mouth. This kid can't even breathe. So nothing by mouth that we get this taken care of. And um, usually with that, they will, the, the swelling will decrease and they'll do much better. As I said, acute laryngotracheal bronchitis or croup, whatever you want to call it, usually it's a virus that happens and we treat these with just steroids. Usually this croup is um, you've had an upper respiratory infection and then the swelling starts, okay? And then you start hearing the inspiratory strider. And usually when you lay down at night, that's when you hear it, right? And then you, the children usually come in at three in the morning, the parents go, we can't stop the coughing. He keeps coughing and coughing. And then we went outside to bring him here and he stopped coughing. The change of environment sometimes will stop that coughing, but they sound like a seal. They're barking and barking. Now, <clears throat> the croup itself is a very easy thing to correct, but if it continues and it's not treated and they don't get their steroid, it can lead to respiratory acidosis and respiratory failure. Many times they'll give them one shot of Decadron. Sometimes they'll give them uh, multiple days of prednisolone or a pred, depending on patient condition. You know, if they're awake and alert and they can breathe good, something oral. Sometimes, you know, the kid's not doing well, we'll give it a shot, doesn't matter. So our goals in all of these, epiglottitis, croup, what do we wanna do? Number one, maintain your airway. That's always priority in nursing. Maintain hydration. Um, whether it's orally or if we have to give IV and you know epiglottitis is going to get IV. Once we get the aerosols in, we're going to have the air that's entering that child's body, uh, nebulized mist that's moist and a little bit of oxygen because oxygen just ease, will help um, oxygenate the patient. It doesn't do anything else, but helps the oxygen go to the body. And again, give the epi and we'll give steroids. <clears throat> RSV, it's also known as bronchiolitis. You heard of RSV, usually in the younger children. RSV uh, for you and me is a common cold, but for an infant, very young infant, ages one to three months, 
Remember, it's hard to suck, swallow, and breathe. I mean, that's a big deal just to get all that done. Now put some mucus in their nose. They're not going to be able to suck, swallow, and breathe. So they're not going to be eating as well and tire out easily. Now, for a normal child, this is not a big deal. We can suction out the airway and then just take our time feeding them. Rarely do we have to admit these children. If the parent on a normal, you know, that's not immunosuppressed child that can suction the nose out and they can um, feed the baby and take time, these kids will go home. Those children who really um, can be really compromised is those immunosuppressed children. Now, there is an immunization for RSV and it's called Synergist. And this is a monthly immunization given from October till about May. And this is just winter to early spring because most of you do get those changes of weather. I don't down here anymore. So, um, but usually in the fall, there is some weather change that we do see. These are for your cardiac children. These are for your cystic fibrosis. These are for premature children, any respiratory compromise. These children will be getting synergist and it will prevent them from getting bronchiolitis. So pneumonias. <clears throat> well, pneumonias can be due to many different things, but a lot of times pneumonias are a sepsis that gets into the bloodstream that goes to the lungs and then it forms a uh, pneumonia. How do we treat it? It's all symptomatic. If they're coughing, we're gonna be giving them aerosols. We're gonna be giving them Tylenol Motrin for fever. And we're gonna be giving them um, antibiotics as ordered. Now, there is a viral pneumonia, but most of the time, I've never seen a pneumonia go home without antibiotics ever, ever, ever. So usually they're bacterial. There are some complicated pneumonias like mycoplasma. And this pneumonia just means that it is a complex bacteria, which means there's negative and there's positive bacteria. So this child needs two types of antibiotics, needs a penicillin and needs, which covers positive bacteria and then negative like ciprofloxin, which will cover those. So two types of antibiotics will be given but we do have a pneumococcal vaccine now, which is given early, which helps again, prevents the child from younger children to fight against that. Now pertussis, there is an um, immunization for. So why do I mention it? Well, there are some cases that are coming around and it's because many people, parents, do not believe in immunization because of a lot of wives tale regarding the chicken pox vaccine and they felt that it caused autism. Well, that was a, um, it was a fallacy. It was a false research study that a physician put out. Um, the physician no longer practices. And um, it did still to this day has many parents not immunizing their children. So even though all of our children are immunized, one child can have pertussis and it's airborne and it spreads like wildfire. This is a child that gets extremely ill. So um, when we did just recently have a couple of cases here in South Florida and these children needed to be admitted, they have to go into reverse airflow rooms to protect the rest of the population. And it's a long recovery. One thing children like to do is swallow things, right? Everything in the mouth, mouth, mouth. Well, they love coins. I mean, they like a lot of other stuff too, but coins is the big one. And they don't like the pennies. They like quarters, the biggest one, right? It's in the mouth and all of a sudden it's gone. Now, I have seen many quarters um, go down children. And it, this is one of my x-rays of one of my kids that I saw. And um, this child was, oh, three or four, I wanna say and um, swallowed the quarter. And years ago, we would take this kid to the OR and do a bronchoscopy and pull it out. But that requires OR, OR time, recovery, et cetera. Today, we don't do that. Listen how we do this. We take like a Foley catheter, a Foley catheter, put it down the throat beyond where the coin is, 
blow up the balloon and the child sits on the surgeon's lap. Bend him forward and he pulls it out. He, co he chokes and he'll vomit and he'll spit up the quarter. And it is less um, type of um, injury to that child by doing it that way than actually even do the bronch with these clips that can go in and that can, you know, touch the bronchus. So, and it works. And what I usually do on these children is I say, well, I know it's a quarter. I said, if I get it first, it's mine. So there, after it comes out, the kid's not thinking about it, he just vomited and choked. He's worrying about getting the quarter before me, the nurse, gets on the floor and gets it. Of course, the kid always wins. But did I distract the child? Absolutely. And that's part of children, just to tell you those things. So usually these children then are just walk, watched for a little while, make sure their airway is okay, and they go home. One of the other type of pneumonias, not the viral or bacterial or mycoplasma, is aspiration. And it could be from food, you know, reflux coming up and going into the lungs. Um, but it also could be that wonderful, great smelling baby powder. I mean, I love Johnson Johnson baby powder. You know, younger in my career, I put powder on the babies because we didn't know better then. And I love the smell of it. But the powder in the air gets in the lungs, it irritates them. Have you ever cleaned your bathroom? Not have good ventilation, use bleach and cleaners and inhale that stuff, what happens? You get started coughing, the throat hurts. Well, this is the same thing that can happen to children. So at this point, we teach those parents, keep them away from harsh chemicals because they do burn the lungs and could cause a chemical aspiration to your lungs there. Acute respiratory distress syndrome is when your lungs get hurt. It could be due to, uh, here I'm South Florida drowning, and I've seen quite a few drownings in my career. Um, but a lot of times it's due to an overwhelming sepsis. The kid comes in, has an infection, body can't handle it, overwhelming sepsis, it goes to the lungs. Remember I said, in the blood, it's gonna go to the lungs. And the lungs say, oh, I can't deal with this, tighten it up. All the alveoli are tight and you're not exchanging oxygen and carbon dioxide. And now it re requires some really good ventilators and respiratory care, trying to get these lungs open. I mean, it could have been due to a car accident, trauma. Adolescents, drug overdoses can cause it too. But um, usually these children take a long time if they do recover from it. This is a, a serious thing when they go into ARDS. Now, mentioning drowning as I did, most drownings, when I've seen them, they have already recovered at the poolside and rescue brings them in. And the parents are like, well, why is he here? Oh yes, he was down, but he came up. We went two things, you know, pushed him twice on the chest and he spit it up the water and he's fine. Well, because of the lungs, it's up to three days later, they could respond to it and they could go and their O2 saturations will drop and then they'll become ARDS. So these children will be admitted to a step down telemetry or even the ICU if they need to, to be their O2 sats monitored for three days before they let them go home. So as I said, ARDS mortality is very high. And it's just trying to ventilate these children. Many of them end up on ECMO, which is like a heart lung machine, but it doesn't, all it does is oxygenate the blood and give it back to the child to let that lung uh, heal, um, make, let the lungs heal so they can breathe on themselves eventually, hopefully. Asthma, common, common childhood type of diagnosis. Many children with asthma become adults with asthma. And it's basically a hyper -responsive, responsiveness of the bronchus. And they get an antigen in there, some allergies, something allergen they don't like, and it starts to swell up. And now you hear this cough, 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 cough. And then you start hearing wheezing, wheezing, and wheezing. And then you have them coughing and then this prolonged expiration because air goes in easy, but because it gets caught up in all of this swelling, you can't get it out. So you will see them breathe out. And at the end of the blowing it out, if you're listening to the breath sounds, you'll hear a squeak. 
at the end. So they'll breathe out and then all of a sudden the lobe that's really bad. And sometimes that is a good sound. Sometimes you barely even hear that with this. So what do we do for asthma? Well, number one is to try to keep these children in check and keep them normal. That's what we wanna do. But how do we do that? Well, we're gonna evaluate the lungs, know what the lungs are doing. And of course, testing for allergens, it could be as simple as grass. So this child, do you want them out playing soccer or baseball? Maybe not. Maybe there's other sports that they could do because grass throws them into asthma attacks. Um, so allergen testing is really important. So preventing your aspirations. Now you see these little spacers here. They're all different sizes. They're from small children, one-year-old, all the way up to adults. Because we have these little um, meter dose inhalers, the little puffers, okay? We have our rescue, our albuterol. We can put it at the end of it, have the mask around the face, squish it one, two, two whatever the dose is, they breathe in and out, they get the dose. You will see many children come in to the emergency room or, or to the doctor's office that their asthma for the last two days has gotten worse and worse. And they keep using their MDI and it's not working. You know what my first question is? Did you use a spacer? Because it could have just been blown in the air. There's many adults who can't push and inhale at the same time. It's very difficult. It's like walking and chewing gum. Some people can't do that. It's the same thing, squirt and inhale. But using a spacer, you know they've gotten the dose. So the first thing I would do is, just, come on, let me give you a spacer. Let's do it together. You know, give yourself an inhale and immediately you'll see a response to it because they've been trying for two days at home, but now they come in here and now I was able to show them how to use a spacer. So again, nursing education is probably 90% of your job. So to prevent asthma, we've done all the workup, we've done the allergy testing, you know, we know how to take our rescue now. So now we need to prevent. So long-term medications. Well, adults, you've heard about Simbicort, Advair, Rio. These are little a bit of steroid inhales and they're to prevent bronchospasms, not for an acute rescue. Albuterol is your rescue. And what it does, it keeps the lungs calm so that it, these allergies don't uh, uh, like to make it inflamed and, and put you into an asthma attack. In children, we use something called Pulmacort, and that is the morning and night dose. We also have um, your Singular, which we use for kids as young as two years old now. Um, and it's a Claritin for type for asthma. So it's specific for the lungs. So Singular um, is a newer drug and it does help prevent it. So keeping these children, you know, their lungs from being inflamed with these twice daily morning and night, either inhales or little um, with the spacer, little MDIs can prevent and then with giving that. Now, during an asthma attack, there's inflammation. What drug is for inflammation? steroids. So we will be giving steroids. When do they get it IV? When do they get it by mouth? Patient condition. If they're not doing well, you'll get an IV and IV meds. If they're talking to you, but still coughing, I'm going to give it by mouth. Okay. So patient condition. Okay. Now let's start talking about the heart. Okay. Now there's two types of heart defects in children, congenital, they're, they're born with it. There's nothing they can do. I mean, if you think about what the heart has to do into utero, it's a stalk, it turns, it twists, it comes up, twists on each other. I mean, I'm surprised that more hearts aren't disformed because they are so much changes during fetal, um, when they're you know developing in mom. Now there's also acquired, and it could be due to infection. We've heard of like viral myocarditis. I mean, that's what cardiomyopathy. These things can happen. Um, autoimmune lupus, what does lupus do? Doesn't it attack hearts? Sure, one of those things. Could be due to the environment or it could be due to family and heredity. Now, this is a picture of circulation. 
Now, you do need to know your anatomical parts of the heart. You need to know the names of the valves and the chambers and the two um, arteries that come off of the heart. So we have a right atrium, which goes through tricuspid valve into the right ventricle, up through the pulmonary artery, into the lungs, back to the heart by the pulmonary veins, into the left atrium, through the mitral valve, into the left ventricle, then through the aorta, uh, aortic valve into the aorta, and then it goes the aorta to the body. So the right side of the heart is not as oxygenated because the left side is pumping the blood out, high pressure, getting blood everywhere. And then it just comes back in that right side and gets back into that right atrium. So, and it's been used up. So now we need to reoxygenate it back into the lungs, back left ventricle, boom, out to the body. Now, I'm gonna give you a scenario about a garden hose and a kink, okay? So when a garden hose kinks, what happens? The faucet will squirt a little bit, right? Because it has to relieve pressure. Usually, if there, or if there's a hole in the, the, the uh, hose, you're gonna see it, it's gonna see it squirting because there's pressure. It has to go somewhere to relieve the pressure. So what if I kinked this heart right after the subclavian, um, those three little things that come off the aorta, the aortic arch, let's say right after that, there's a kink. There's a narrowing. That's called a coarctation of the aorta. So let's think what happens. Well, the blood can't go down. Some of it can, but not much. So what happens? It's got to go back, doesn't it? So it goes back. In older children, what you see is that three little vessels that go up to the head you're gonna see headaches and nosebleeds in the older children because some are not diagnosed till later. You don't see them initially, okay? Now, a baby, what happens? Usually you'll go back down into your left ventricle, that fills up. Goes up to the left atrium, that fills up. The blood this still has to go somewhere, goes up into the lungs and it fills up. So what happens? Congestive heart failure. I have seen an infant come in at three months old and they were in congestive heart failure. They thought it was failure to thrive. They didn't know what was going on. It was a coarctation. And you know how we diagnose that? Well, if you think of all the pressure that's going up, you know that blood pressure on the upper extremities is gonna be really high, right? Because you have more blood up there. So when the blood's going down, there's not much blood going down, especially to the feet, it's a long way away. So you're gonna see decreased or no pulses, no dorsalis pedis, no posterior tibial, or very slight and lower blood pressures. So on an infant, you're gonna feel no pulses. What's the next thing I'm gonna do? I'm gonna do a four extremity blood pressure. I wanna see the difference between the pressures. Do you know in my career, I did diagnose one and I was new into newborn ICU at the time. And it made me feel pretty good that I caught that because as a new nurse, especially as a new nurse in the newborn ICU on an admission that had just come from the labor room, I felt pretty good about that. And we were able to start treatment quicker. So coarctation. So many times, as I said, initially, we, there's many diagnoses as we know right away. That one little girl who came in who had coarctation, these are the things that we saw. She wasn't eating well, tiring, easy. Her heart has fluid going up into her lungs. She can't breathe. She can't be oxygenated, right? So she don't have any energy. So poor feeding. She's not able to eat nutrition. So failure to thrive. She's small. She's skinny. She has no tolerance to any activities. And of course, if this continues with poor nutrition, we'll see those developmental delays, won't we? Now, sometimes we have a history, many times we don't. Um, and it could be from a familiar history, but that doesn't always play out. So when you see a kid with a cardiac condition, what do we look at? Nutritional status. Most congenital heart defect children will be small. They will not be bigger in, you know, the percentages. They, they won't be. Why? 
Their hearts and bodies are working so hard to get blood around, they're burning all their calories. So these will be smaller children, okay? Their color, it might look as dusky and cyanotic as this baby here. Um, sometimes they are pink, depending on what sort of condition they have. A lot of times you can hear those um, unusual pulsations or murmurs in the chest. Many of these children, you can put your hand on the chest and you can feel the buzzing going on. They're feeling zoom, zoom going on. And as they get older, you'll see things like the clubbing of fingers. Newborns, no, that's too early for that. So we will look at the chest, see how it moves, just, uh, just looking at it, number one. Um, we're going to put them on a monitor, do an EKG. We're going to um, feel those peripheral pulses, look at that rhythm, and then are there any murmurs going on there? So they do the EKG, 12 lead EKG, and even tiny little infants like this, we can do a 12 lead EKG. We have to cut those little things down so small to get them on them, but we can do a really good 12 lead EKG. Next thing we're gonna do is an echocardiogram. Now, when you see an echocardiogram becomes positive, there's something going on, be ready, this kid will be prepared for cardiac cath. The cardiac catheterization goes in and looks at the structures, looks at different pressures, and um, this will help the surgeon who may or may not need to do surgery, you know, make a decision. So that's your diagnostic. Interventional type of um, cardiac catheterizations that you might see is they've got these new procedure, um, a helix device, which Instead of closing a hole between chambers, whether an ASD between the two atrium or a VSD, ventricular septal defect, or hole between the ventricle, they go up with a cardiac cath with this little tube and has two sides. And they put it on the other side of the hole. So you have this little round thing on one side, it pops open, it puts their other round thing on the other side, and it stops blood from moving. So you don't need to do surgery. So they've got a lot of neat things out there. And your EP studies are usually used for your tachydysrhythmias, your supraventricular tachycardia. So nursing care, this is what we need to know. So how do we take care of these kids? Well, you prepare them for cardiac calf, just like you would do if they're going to the OR. Usually NPL only two hours prior to surgery if they're eating, because we don't want their blood sugars to get too low. We let children eat almost to the end. When they come back, first thing you're gonna do, you are gonna check the pulse, the, um, the dressing for leakage. If you can imagine, they go into the femoral artery and the febrile vein. These are huge vessels and they hold it. They put pressure there and it you know, puts a clot there to stop it. They put a pressure dressing, but many times the movement of getting them back to the room or into your unit, wherever they're going, it knocks off the clot and all of a sudden you're, this child's in a pool of blood. An infant can bleed out their body less than five minutes. So my first thing, I'm checking that dressing. Well, what if I see it bleeding? What's the first thing I'm gonna do? I'm gonna take my two fingers. If this is where the holes are, I'm gonna put my two fingers closer to the heart and push down and put pressure and call for help. And it's just gonna hold it there until it clots off again, okay? So you're, make sure you press it. Just like if you had a big, you know, bleeding something, you put pressure on it to stop it. Same sort of thing, same concept. You're gonna do some vital signs. You're gonna check the pulses. You're gonna document what the pulses feel like because after this putting stuff up into the femoral artery and vein, sometimes they're a little decreased on that leg. So you just document it, it's normal. And we're going to be looking at blood glucose levels. Does the child have enough sugar or they have too much? You know, do they need to eat or drink or do we need to start an IV with sugar in it? So those are things we look at. One of the things with cardiac cath, you told, I've told you about that dressing and that clot and the area, that leg, and it's the right leg, must be maintained straight. Okay, that leg, if we move it around, it's going to dislodge the clot and cause bleeding. So nursing care, keep the leg straight in bed for 24 hours, okay, to pre pre prevent 
that clot from coming off. You can elevate the head of the bed slowly so they can eat and drink, but they're gonna be on bed rest for 24 hours. Sometimes these children are so crazy, they want their parents. I will pick the child up, put him in the parent's arms, but I maintain that right leg straight. And they'll usually calm down, go to sleep. So it's actually better. So congenital dark heart defect, you don't really realize how many children have heart defects until you work in the unit. There are quite a few. Now, major cause of death in the first year after prematurity, that's how many there is, okay? Most common defect is a hole between the ventricles, the bottom chamber called a ventricular septal defect or a VSD. And we know that the most common um, syndrome that has the most congenital heart disease is your Downs children. It could be as simple as a VSD, but it also could be a truncus, AV canal, which you don't have to know those, but these are different defects that are really specific to Downs children. So there are two type of congenital heart defects. Now, if you have a VSD, you're still getting oxygen around. It, your ventricle has a hole between it. And yeah, some of that blood from the left side will go back to the right side and back into the lungs, but still you got oxygen going around there. It's good. So that's an acyanotic heart disease, but we do have cyanotic heart disease where there is no mixing. So those are the ones that we need to be concerned about. And in the next slide, I'm gonna go over some of those. Now you just heard me mention about an a, a VSD and the left side's going over to the right side, the blood goes and back into the lungs. This is shunting, we call that shunting. Now, in the beginning, I told you, the left side is a lot of pressure. It's pushing out the blood, blood's flowing back in from the lungs, there's a lot of high pressure. Now the right side, the blood just gets back there. So there's very low pressure. So if I have high pressure on the left side, guess where the blood's gonna go? To the right. And what happens whether it's an ASD, the upper the, uh, chambers or the lower chambers, it goes through and back and up into the lungs. And you'd be, re, um, be going back through the pulmonary circulation. So there is shunting. That's what shunting means. Okay, this is a picture out of your book. And this are our, where are those conditions that um, you need to know, okay? So I just mentioned about ASDs, atrial septal defect, VSDs, ventricular septal defect, and that they increase pulmonary blood flow. And it's because of the shunting. It pushes blood back over the right side that is already oxygenated, but it goes back over there, and goes back through the lungs. So that's increased pulmonary blood flow. Now, there is something called a PDA, a patent ductus arteriosus. Now, during fetal circulation, the pulmonary artery and the aorta are connected. There's a vessel there. That a little bit after birth, it just closes up because there are hormones called prostaglandins that the pregnant woman produces that keeps open that vessel during pregnancy. And then you don't have the prostaglandins, it closes. Now, this patent ductus arteriosus, because it connects the right, um, the pulmonary artery and the aorta, you're gonna see blood flowing from the aorta back into the lungs because where's the pressure? That left ventricle's really fast, right? Pushing, so there's a lot of pressure goes back up into the lungs. And I'm gonna talk more about this patent ductus when we get to the other side of this. Coarctation, we've already talked about, obstruction, blood flows up into the head in older children. You'll see those headaches and you'll see nosebleeds. And then in younger children, you're gonna see them most likely going into congestive heart failure if they're not taken care of. Um, and then what do we do? We just fix the coarctation and support the heart till we get the heart stronger again. Now, there are two words called stenosis and atresia. A means without, right? A is without. Atresia means no opening. That's tricuspid atresia, okay? There's no opening between the right atrium and the right ventricle, none. So how are we gonna oxygenate that child? 
we're going to keep that patent ductus arteriosus open. That's the only lifeline of getting oxygen to the body. So then it will allow the lungs to still oxygenate the body and it will put the oxygen into the aorta, which will go to the body. Now, didn't I just say that the prostaglandins are from mom and after birth, it closes? Well, we put these children on a synthetically made prostaglandin IV, extremely slow drip. And it keeps that vessel open so that we will give this child the oxygen they need because without oxygen, the baby will die. So this is your lifeline, patent ductus arteriosus. Now, aortic stenosis is a narrowing, pulmonic stenosis is a narrowing of those um, arteries. And then in mixed blood supply, well, let's go first to the most tested diagnosis you'll see on your NCLEX. They love Tetralogy of Fallot. What is Tetralogy of Fallot? Tetralogy of Fallot is a pulmonary artery problem. It's intermittent, where all of a sudden, it's like a piece of tissue goes over the pulmonary artery in that right ventricle and doesn't allow blood to flow. It doesn't allow blood to go up into the lungs. I have seen a child, an infant, that I'm there changing a diaper, or I was doing a quick little bath or something, three o'clock in the morning, and he went from O2 sats of 100 to 10 in one minute, 10% O2 sats. He turned black. So what did I do? Well, the one thing that you can do as a nurse without an order is what we call a knee chest. We take the knees and chest and we pull them together. So you almost put your face into the knees. And what does that do? It changes the pressure in the abdomen and the chest cavity, and it pops open that whatever skin is covering that pulmonary artery and allows blood to flow. So that's the knee chest. Now, some of these children are older and we don't know that they're tetralogy. So you might see an older child, two years old, all of a sudden they'll squat on the floor because they're having a tet spell and they by themselves have done a knee chest. They sit, their chest and their abdomen cavities change the pressure and now they're fine. So tetralogy of Fallot is that diagnosis you are going to see again and again. And then the other one is transposition of great arteries. And it's exactly that. What are the great arteries of a heart? The aorta and the pulmonary artery, right? They're switched. So it means you have systemic blood going around in a circle. You have pulmonic circulation going around. They're not mixing. This child is not oxygenated. So how do we oxygenate this child? Same way as we do the tricuspid atresia. We put on a prostaglandin drip which helps with cardiac output and oxygenation. And it keeps this child alive until we can decide when we wanna do surgery. So it's not going to be an emergent, you can plan it. Many of these children are fed bottles up till maybe it's a week later they do surgery. So the parents have a chance to bond with these children because they are oxygenated because we have that duct that's open, that patent ductus. And then the worst of all of the diagnoses here is a hypoplastic left heart syndrome. So the heart is pumped by the left ventricle. It's the big engine of the heart and it's thick and it's floppy and there's no output at all. And it's a very small area that blood flows into. So nothing goes to the body. Um, this is uh, a surgery. Well, which requires three different stages. Most of them in the end require to have a heart transplant. So that is a very hard diagnosis to live with. Now, I'll give you some good news. I had a little boy, Tom, Thomas, my little Thomas guy. He had his three stage surgery, telling you he had the hardest time every stage. He was the sickest kid and um, really, had to struggle. We got him through him. About age eight, his heart went into failure. It just wouldn't work anymore. He needed a transplant. 
And he was actually up in Orlando at the time at their facility, Arnold Palmer. And it was in February. And he says, no, mom, I'm going to get my heart on Valentine's Day. I know I am. Valentine's morning at 5 a.m., they got a call. They had a heart for him. And he transplanted. And he did well. He is now 18 years old. And I'm seeing pictures of him all the time living a beautiful life. So um, transplants can work well. And I'm telling you, cardiac patients, families are the best in the world. This is some pictures that showed you more about what I just said, okay? And now that congestive heart failure, which the coarctation goes into, right? Now the lungs are full of fluid. So the heart cannot pump, whether it's due to a weak heart or an obstruction in the way that can't you know, pump past. So that muscle's trying so hard and it gets just so weak and then be going into failure. You're gonna see a child tachypnic, tachycardic, restless because they're not being oxygenated well. You're gonna see x-rays that are just full of fluid. And it goes into so many other things that go on with it. But what is our goal as a nurse? Our goal is to have that child to be able to breathe easier. So we want to improve the cardiac function. So how do we do that? Well, the heart is pumping with all of this extra fluid. We wanna get rid of that fluid. We wanna do something, give some sort of um, medicine, something called Primacore, but you don't need to know it. Medicine, heart medicine, that let the heart work as effectively as they can. Gives them a little help, medicine to help the heart beat stronger, to help get that fluid around, to get rid of it. And at that time, you're gonna oxygenate better and the child's gonna be a lot happier. So how do we, as a nurse, monitor this fluid loss, how the heart's working? How do we know it? Well, we're gonna be looking at what the heart rate is, the respiratory rate, what's the blood pressures, we are going to be listening to lungs, O2 saturations. We are going to be doing daily weights and strict, strict INO on these children. And um, you will see many scales are a little different. So you will see many hospitals number their scales. So if they were weighed on number one scale, next time they should be weighed on number one scale. Um, and then with these children, they're in congestive failure. They're really tired. How are we going to maintain their nutritional status? Well, many times they'll put feeding tubes in to assist because they can't eat on their own, especially in the very beginning when they're really full of fluid. And it's very hard if you can imagine a parent looking at their child struggling to breathe, their chest retracting. It's, you know, and you see them nasal flaring and grunting and you know that they're struggling it's hard to watch a mother look at that so give that support to those family to say we are going to help this is what we're going to do this is what we should see this is what you're going to look for losing weight the fluid etc hypoxemia uh, i just mentioned that hypoplastic left heart now because we're not getting oxygen around on this child Normal O2 sats on a hypoplastic left heart at birth, 75 to 85, if you're lucky. I've seen them 65 most of the time. They barely oxygenate, but that's okay. That's okay to start with because we'll be doing surgery um, pretty quickly. And what we're doing actually is making a more permanent PDA. It's called a, PD, a BT shunt, late lot tussing shunt. And it connects the aorta to the pulmonary artery. And that's there for a couple of months till they get bigger and then it's other stages. Now, what does the body do? You know, the body is unique and it's really special. So you have this child whose O2 stats are really low. So the body says, you know, I need to make more red blood cells because we need to carry more oxygen around. So your body produces red blood cells, but your oxygen saturations aren't gonna go up because that's all the oxygen that they can produce, okay? So what happens? These children, you will see hemoglobins and hematocrits very high. You might see 18 and 54 instead of 14 and 42. I mean, you're gonna see hemoglobin and hematocrits very high, very thick dark blood called polycythemia. And that's why 
the body is trying to produce red blood cells to carry oxygen, which it doesn't have. And then, as I said, these are pictures of clubbing um, on a child. Maybe this child's about 11 years old here. You, you'll start seeing the clubbing on these children who are like a hypoplastic left heart. So you've heard me talk this whole way through about teaching parents, you know, and letting them know what's going on, educate them. I'm telling you, I've never met a greater bunch of parents than I have met in the cardiac intensive care unit. They are knowledgeable. They're smart. Some of the best parents in the world um, have cardiac children. I mean, it's good for the kid. They've got these parents that can really assist them at home, but you're going to have to educate them about everything so they know what to look for, when to know that the kid is breathing too fast or heart's too fast or, you know, there's heart's too slow or not urinating enough or not looking right. And then what procedures are coming up, preparing the parents, they can prepare the child. And always when you're getting these children in, you're always setting them up to, for going home. Bacterial endocarditis is just like adults. You know, they get an infection in the inner lining of the endocardium and this is prophylaxis before procedures, just like adults, no, no difference. <clears throat> Rheumatic fever is a condition that is caused by a strep throat that the parents didn't give the entire medication for or didn't follow up to make sure it was completely gone. Uh, what it does, it attacks the heart valves, okay? And can cause permanent heart valve damage. Um, usually they come in with symptoms of fever. Um, they will have the aches and pains and sore throat. And um, sometimes they are stumbling when they're walking Korea. You'll see these things with these children. Um, these children uh, will require a long-term antibiotic. Now you've got to kill that strep that now has attacked the whole body. All the symptoms will dissipate, go away, except if there's heart valve damage, that will not go away. And many of them, it's usually your mitral valve, either repair or needs replacement. We're watching kids for cholesterol now. Oh, we didn't before, we're finding out, kids do have a tendency for high cholesterol. Cardiac dysrhythmias, doesn't matter adult children, you're gonna have slow, fast, or irregular heartbeats. And they're all treated with the same medications. There's no difference between an adult medication and a child's medication. It's just the dose, milligrams per kilograms, micrograms per kilograms. And we do give digoxin, probably the most popular of all of the um, drugs. You see that in adults, well, it's in children, new, new children. Now, an adult can tell you if they're nauseous or seeing yellow spots and stuff, right? if they're on digoxin with digtoxicity, how would an infant tell you? They'll be vomiting. And just with vomiting, I'm gonna say, this kid's on digoxin, I'm gonna hold the dose. I'm gonna call the provider. I'm gonna get a dig level, okay? And same thing, counting the heart rate. No, it's not gonna be 60. It's gonna be 100 as a low heart rate, not 60. Um, also, potassium has to be the same uh, level. And the doesn't matter lab values, they're the same adult or a child. Pulmonary artery hypertension is when the lungs, again, they're tight. They don't wanna exchange due to many different reasons. Um, I've seen children, these children will need eventually a heart transplant. I've seen some children get to the point where they've had to have continuous infusions that they had to have for uh, keeping their lungs open. You know what they're using also for pulmonary artery hypertension? Viagra. It dilates the vessels of the arteries. They found that out. I've, I heard that it, as a child who came back from Boston and I heard he's on Viagra and I'm like, oh, gee. <laughs> Cardiomyopathy, usually due to a viral infection, could be familiar, could be due to some metabolic, something that goes on. Um, these children have big floppy heart. Many of them will require a transplant. So the biggest concern with a heart transplant is rejection. You know, um, 
we do put them on those immunosuppressive drugs. Yes, they'll be on it for life, but it, rejection is the biggest thing. And we are now looking at children and their blood pressure earlier than ever. Um, we're in the child's two years old and uh, two years and older now. We're doing blood pressures on all of them. And the reason is we're finding young, young children with high blood pressure. And what happens to an adult with high blood pressure happens to a child. You're going to hurt your kidneys, you know, and you could go into renal failure due to hypertension. So saving children earlier, we're doing more preventative care for these children. Kawasaki disease is a viral vasculitis. It's systemic vasculitis from a virus, okay? These children will show up with initially, it takes a good seven to 10 days to diagnose this one. Just like it took all that time for our mononucleosis to figure out what it was. This is the same thing. Child will show with just a fever, cough, cold, maybe a little rash, not feeling too good. They'll say, okay, it's a viral, Tylenol Motrin. Go back in, now we have our, this rash going on. Now we're starting to see maybe a strawberry tongue and you're like, mm, I don't know. Let's put them on some antibiotics to be sure they come back in. Now they've got the peeling, blistery, cracked hands and soles of the feet. And the big clue, these big red glow in the dark eyes. And I'm telling you, they are big and red and glow. Um, the director of our cardiac unit, the physician son was admitted at three years old with it. And the red eyes, I will never, ever forget. So our biggest concern with Kawasaki disease because of the vasculitis is that it can affect the coronary arteries. And what it does, it produces these little aneurysms, which an aneurysm can do what? Can pop and guess what? Your child is going to have a really hard time living at that point. My daughter actually had Kawasaki's disease when she was four, and she got a coronary artery aneurysm from it. She's 10 now, um, wow. still on aspirin, so but yeah. So and why we is went she to the emergency aspirin? room why is for the aneurysm. It's for clots mm -hmm. and to promote circulation and flow. Wow, that's interesting. So she's still on the aspirin. Yep, and she sees a cardiologist like once a year. The aneurysm is stable. They said it's not growing. Um, That's awesome. At all. But yeah, we went to the emergency room five times before they figured it out. That's exactly what I'm saying. Um, it used to be one of those diagnoses that and when I see these different long-term something happening, you know, I was that nurse who said, I got to figure this out before the doctor comes in. I got to know what this is, you know, and say, I think it's a Kawasaki. And uh, many times I was uh, right. And um, it helps with the treatment. So treatment is like um, Danica said, it's aspirin, baby aspirin um, and IVIG, intravenous immunoglobulins for about a month. Usually you get Kawasaki once and it goes away. You don't get it again. But as you see, Danica's child does have an aneurysm and does require frequent follows up with the physicians. Shock can happen. Um, most common, common shock in infants and children is infection. You barely see it with other stuff, but it's septic. It's usually infection and um, this causes the shock. We know that it does go in, sepsis goes in, affects the lungs and that creates what the shock goes through. What do you see in shock? Elevated heart rate, decreased blood pressure, decreased perfusion, no urinary output, and you know that something's going on. So surgical closure of that patent ductus arteriosus would do what? So where is that PDA? It connects the pulmonary artery to the aorta. So mm -hmm. if we clip that off, what's gonna happen? D. Absolutely. D. Because the flow with trying to push blood it's not going back into the lungs now, it's going to the body. Very good, good job. So as I told you, it's a pretty heavy, heavy um, PowerPoint today. There are a couple of things that I don't get to cover. Um, so they are in your Kahoot. So who wants to win a Kahoot today? Brent, you gonna win today? 
Oh, Jillian's ready. I'll try. That's not going to win. <laughs> All right. Cody, how about you today? There you go. Ashley, yeah. Jessica's on TV for us. She wants to be the movie star. So I guess it's <laughs> going to be her today. <laughs> Good luck, everybody. I think there's 50 some out of these. It's one of those days. So next week, I will be giving you your review for the next exam so that you'll have it early. It's already made. We got it done early this semester. So I was very pleased with that. And you'll be getting that. And then we'll be setting up when the reviews are. And of course, again, they'll be posted in the announcements and all the recordings too. Because it'll be week seven. And this is five, so two more weeks. It goes by quick, guys. And as I said, remember, the end of this semester is rough. Be prepared. There was a question that came out. Do you remediate Kaplan? Yes, you do. Even the right answers. Every question must be remediated one to two minutes, okay? Here we go. Week five, respiratory, cardiac. A major of upper respiratory infections are caused by what? URIs, what causes them? It's all viruses. Usually most of them are viruses and You'll have go to the doctor, cough, high fevers, and you're scared and nervous and want antibiotics, and they go, it's a virus. Tile and Motrin, drink plenty of fluids, and usually go away in a day or two. Multi-select. What would you suspect if a child has a dry, bothersome cough that keeps them awake at night? All right, so this is a diagnosis that you'll see brought in to the ER at three o'clock in the morning. And the key thing here is dry. I mean, if you've ever had a child or yourself with these conditions, this cough is crazy and you can't stop it. Now, dry, bothersome cough is not asthma, okay? And this is awake at night. Asthma doesn't awake at night, it's all the time. Bronchitis and the croup are the ones at night, you're trying to sleep, you lay down and this cough is crazy and it cough, cough, cough. They usually will order some sort of a narcotic cough uh, medicine because it's that severe and they're not sleeping at all. The monthly immunization for RSV is what? So remember, RSV is also called bronchiolitis. It's more dangerous in the younger children and uh, especially those immunosuppressed. So we give Synergist. It is monthly from September to about March, April, May, somewhere in there. Um, and it helps prevent it for these children. All of the signs are, all the following are signs of early respiratory distress in children except I mean, that picture of that kid with that retraction of the sternum, you will see retractions that severe. And you'll see supraclavicular, you'll see that almost to the backbone on some of these children who are so distressed. Now, you'll see tachycardia. Absolutely, the heart's trying to beat to keep up, get oxygen around, there is none. They're diaphoretic because they're working so hard. They're restless because they're hypoxic. When they get to the point of bradycardia, they're gonna code and die, okay? Especially in their respiratory distress. An infant who is in respiratory distress, you'll see nasal flaring, and you might hear this little eh at the end of each breath. They'll breathe and go eh. We call it a grunt. You see an infant, 
nasal flaring and grunting, that child is about to code on you, they need immediate, immediate care. That is priority. A four-year-old child has been taking meds for asthma and the child is still wheezing. What information is important? So the one thing I said, always ask, how are you giving their medications to make sure that they're getting? So the first thing is check, are you using a spacer? And if they're not, put one on and let them take it and they'll see the difference. Brandy's up top and on fire. Cody, go get her. An eight month old with croup exhibits what signs and symptoms of respiratory distress? Croup. So remember, croup is upper airway, and it's a lot of that inspiratory uh, strider that goes on and is barking, and it's retracting. Air can't get in and out, and then, of course, hypoxic, they'll be restless. Signs and symptoms of asthma include all except... I think the one thing that separates uh, an upper respiratory from asthma is wheezing. When you have a child that you're hearing wheezing throughout the lungs, that is your asthma child, okay? They start this coughing, cacking, like they, it's all of this tightening up bronchospasm. They get short of breath, they start to wheeze. But remember, they get air in, but it gets trapped. So they have to push hard to get the air out. So it's prolonged expiratory phase. Jillian's going up. Signs and symptoms of congenital heart disease include all except. Congenital heart disease, heart not working right. So their weight gain will never be appropriate. It's going to be less than because the heart is working harder to try to get oxygen around because it's not functioning properly. And they're not going to eat well. They're going to tire easily. And they're going to be tachycardic and tipicnic. And that's just part of congenital heart disease. What should you not do to children diagnosed with croup and epiglottitis? Epiglottis. So if you want to look into that mouth, you better be prepared to do an intubation or do a tracheostomy because all you're going to do is most likely increase the inflammation that's in there and it's going to be worse for the child. Don't open their mouth. You don't need to see. Listen. Listen from the outside. Cody is on fire fire. The epiglottis is what? So it is that leaf-like cartilage that covers the trachea when you swallow so that you do not choke. And that's what gets inflamed and covers that trachea and you can't breathe. And now look at Brent, you're on fire. We've got fire, fire. A multi-select. When doing an admission on an infant with a low-grade fever and a loose cough, what information is important? So you're admitting a child into a hospital.
And this kid's got a fever and a cough. What do you need to know? What's important? I want to know if they have immunizations because fever and cough could be many different things. I want to make sure that this is something that if they're in a room with another infant, that they're not going to transmit it to the other child, right? Very important. We don't want to do that. We wanna know where the fevers are and we need to know the medications so that we can continue giving Tylenol and Motrin. We don't need to know for an admission the APGAR scores at birth. It's not our first priority. What is cystic fibrosis? Now you do a case study on cystic fibrosis. I mentioned some of it here. I saw one family that had three boys that all had cystic fibrosis. I'm like, after the second, why didn't you stop? But they had three of them and one was a severe cardiac. What it is, is the lungs get full of uh, mucus. It gets thick like a Petri dish and you can't oxygenate. In fact, it's an area where bacteria love to grow. Then you've got your small intestines where you're trying to um, take your nutrients and the enzymes to break down to be able to eat and you can't. So you have a child who nutritionally has issues and you have a child who can't breathe. So this is a child who needs a lot, a lot of care. My cousin passed away at 15 from it. It was really bad. Wow. Wow. That's hard to hear. It's a very difficult diagnosis to take care of. It is a constant daily struggle to keep the lungs open and moving. And then of course, nutritionally to make sure they get the nutrition that they require. I'm sorry to hear that, sorry. What is the greatest risk for an infant having a cardiac catheterization? What did I tell you about cardiac catheterizations? It's that hemorrhaging from the side of the catheter, from the cardiac calf. That's why I check that first. And if it's bleeding, two fingers, I'm going to put a lot of pressure above it, next closer to the heart, and it will stop eventually. How is cystic fibrosis identified? Well, you will see as we go along getting into the diagnosis and the systems of the body now that there are several diseases that are diagnosed by a newborn not having a stool within the first three days of birth. Cystic fibrosis children will not have stools um, and that they'll go and they'll look for it. So what they do is a sweat test. Now, if you took this infant and you licked their skin, you would taste salt. Now, I'm not telling you to go lick somebody else's child, but I'm saying if you did, you would taste salt. So they're losing salt like crazy, aren't they? So you're not gonna restrict salt on this child. A multi-select. What is included in the plan of care for a child with cystic fibrosis? So remember it's lungs and it's your small intestines and digestion that's going on. How do we take care of this? So the biggest thing is aggressive chest physiotherapy. You know, they've got these nice vests that you can turn on and they just shake them and they really get those lungs moving. It's aerosols. They're having aerosols with antibiotics all the time. Very important. Um, high protein diet and high carbohydrates. You need, you need extra calories for these children. Um, an infant would get a higher calorie formula. And they do have, usually it's 20 calories per ounce. You can go to 27 calories and more if you need to, to make sure they're gaining weight. And this pancreatic enzymes, we can give them half an hour before they eat. 
We can sprinkle it on their food or even the powder on their food. Just make sure they rinse their mouth when they're done. And the big thing is remember children grow. They'll need a bigger dose as they get older. And that helps with the digestion of their food. So they're gonna get their nutrition because the most important thing in their lives, nutrition, nutrition, nutrition. Brandy's on fire. What is a drug of choice for a pharmacological closure of a PDA? Now, I told you how to keep it open, right? I told you prostaglandins is what we use to keep it open in the case we need, like a tricuspid atresia or a transposition. He didn't mention how to keep, close it if it was open. It is called in the Mephison. It is an NSAID. It's given IV and it's given in up three doses. Now, the neatest thing about being a nurse and giving that medicine, usually these are children, many of them, are premature infants and their PDA keeps open and it just keeps an overflowing their lung. So they need to close it. And it's better than a surgical intervention is to give this here. As a nurse, you hear this big machine murmur in their chest. When you see it close, the murmur goes away and you can hear the difference when that closes, when they're getting that into methicin, okay? A lot of good stuff to remember. <laughs> what is not a feature of a tetralogy of flow? Well, remember tetralogy is on the right side of the heart. So what's not a tetralogy? So the left side of the heart is aortic. So it's definitely not a feature. The biggest thing, tetralogy is a pulmonary artery stenosis and then something flaps over and it prevents blood from going to the lungs. Many of them are born and they have a ventricular septal defect. So it's trying to over oxygenate left to right, but when it's closed, nothing will work. And because it's fighting against blood going up and it can't go up, what happens to the right side? It stretches just like coarctation goes backward like a garden hose. So, and the other thing, there's four different things. You sometimes see what we call an overriding aorta. The aorta sort of pushes over a little bit and just, you know, um, small ends the right side just a little bit. And Brandy's still on fire. What medication would you hold for an infant that is vomiting? And vital signs are 98, 88, 32. So vomiting, the only thing you might see with a child, an infant taking digoxin and that heart rate, 88, is your clue right there. Um, an infant's normal heart rate, 140 to 160. So if you see it 88, problems going on and hold it, get a digoxin level. Why would a child with tetralogy of Fallot not gain weight at the normal rate? So if we are not getting oxygen, you not gonna have energy and you're not gonna eat. And then you're gonna have a smaller child. Plus again, congenital heart defects, they're working harder, they're burning calories. Good job. And hand is now on fire. All are examples of a cyanotic heart murmur except which one? So when we're looking cyanotic, okay, the stenosis is a narrowing 
And this is only the outlet from the left ventricle to go to the body. So they're still getting oxygen. The rest of these things here are all cyanotic. I didn't go over truncus, but that's just the whole thing is open and it's not getting the oxygen where it needs. What is the most common cyanotic congenital heart defect? It's the one I told you, you need to know. So I said, that's the one that NCLEX loves to, to talk about. And it's your tetralogy of Fallot. Most, most common cyanotic. Um, truncus, it's, it's not um, hypoplastic. Thank God it's not the most common because it's the most severe of all. PDAs, they, they're definitely, they're producing oxygen. They're acyanotic. Tetralogy of Fallot, most common. Nursing care following a cardiac catheterization. Absolutely, check that site. We're gonna raise out of bed slowly. We're not touching that extremity. They're not gonna ambulate. They're on bed rest for 24 hours. And Julian's back on fire. Nursing education for cardiac catheterization include all except. We are not gonna bend that extremity. Very good, leave it straight. You don't want that clot to pop and you do not want blood everywhere, it's scary. Which information is the most important when rheumatic fever is suspected? So remember, rheumatic fever is due to a strep infection, which is due to a sore throat that was either not treated or undertreated. Signs of shock in children include all the following except. So shock is hypotension. It's not hypertension. They will have altered mental status because they're not going to have the oxygen to the brain. Poor capillary refill because there's no cardiac output. And of course, they're tachycardic because they're trying to do something, trying to help get blood around. What is the treatment for Kawasaki disease? Aspirin and IVIG, it's both of them and it's about a month long. This is the only time you give aspirin to a child, only time. And what the aspirin does, it prevents clots and it also thins the blood. It's like giving a Coumadin to the child. It's in an aspirin, it's a safe form for children in this case. Which of the following best describes the pathophysiology of Kawasaki disease? <clears throat> Say so multi-system vasculitis, which may affect the coronary arteries. That's why these children, they come in, we start the treatment. And then as soon as we can, usually the next morning or whatever, we will do an echocardiogram. We wanna look at those arteries to make sure what's going on with those coronary arteries. A multi-select. A clinical manifestation of Kawasaki disease is what?
So it's not erythema marginaeum. If there's a different rash they get, it's more uh, sporadic and small. It's not big and thick and demarked like that rash, but there is a rash. They have those blistered, cracked palms of soles of their feet and their palms of their hand. Of course, those eyes are big and red, strawberry tongue, and you'll even see those cracked lips going on. And sometimes you don't see barely, like you'll see a little bit of peeling on the hands. You don't even see the red eyes yet. It's very hard to diagnose. Which of the following is the most common cause of shock in infants and children? <laughs> and that's infection. You know, infection does overwhelm children and that causes shock the most common. <clears throat> What are the defects associated with tetralogy of Fallot? Again, remember it's all right-sided. So it is a pulmonary artery stenosis. Remember there is a VSD that keeps open that misplaced aorta, it sort of pushes over a little bit. And of course the right ventricle, hypertrophy means it's stretched a little bit. The other ones are, have all something on the left side or completely wrong. Good job though. Julian, look at you. A young child with tetralogy of flow may assume which position naturally when having a tet spell. You might see a kid who's two or three that have not been pre uh, repaired for whatever reason. And just naturally they squat to the floor and that helps them change the pressures in their abdomen, and their chest, it pops open, whatever, creating that uh, blood flow not going and it allows oxygenation. Transposition of the great arteries is what? What does that mean? Then I'll ask, what are the great arteries? So the aorta and the pulmonary artery are switched. And that means there is no oxygen going on. This is that diagnosis that needs that PDA to keep open to live. We keep it open with prostaglandins because it promotes cardiac output and oxygenation of the body. And then you can have a very planned surgery, not emergent. Which of the following is not an intervention indicated for transposition of great arteries? Well, I've already told you one. Really didn't describe the others, but I will. <clears throat> So you have your aorta and the pulmonary artery that shouldn't be where they are. So what they do is what we call an arterial switch. We switch them over, okay? Literally pick it up, turn it around and put it back on, okay? Now at birth, we have a patent foraminal valley, right? That's between the two atriums, that little hole that's just there. So we go in through a calf and we make that hole bigger. So now there's more exchange between the right and left side. So now the body's getting oxygen. Um, there is no oral anything. When you talk about transposition of great arteries, you know, it's just the prostaglandins making that punch that hole between the atriums. And then when we do the surgery, it's an arterial switch. So the prostaglandins is the lifeline for that child. A multi-select. Why is prostaglandins given to a child with transposition of the great arteries? So it helps with oxygenation, absolutely, and maintains cardiac output. 
It has nothing to do with an antibiotic, nothing, okay? So it doesn't prevent endocarditis. It's not an infection thing. All it does is keep that patent ductus arteriosus open and allows the heart to be oxygenated and that cardiac output to be maintained. What is the purpose of giving indomethacin to a neonate with a patent ductus arteriosus? We mentioned it earlier in the cahoots. I, we had to guess what indomethacin was. Now I'm asking you, why do we give it? So remember the patent ductus arteriosus is there during fetal circulation. Mom produces a hormone called prostaglandins, which naturally keeps it open. After birth, if we need it, we give that synthetic prostaglandin to keep it open. So indomethacin is given because somehow the body is still producing prostaglandins and keeping that duct open. So it stops it. So it inhibits the prostaglandin and then the duct closes naturally through indomethacin. And if that don't work, they go in and they do a clip. They just clip it. Jillian knew that one. Where is the patent ductus arteriosus? I mentioned it a few times. <clears throat> and it connects the aorta to the pulmonary artery, okay? You need to know that, need to remember it, then you understand why it's oxygen going to the body. Simply, oxygen going to body. The heart defect that allows blood to pass from the left ventricle to the right ventricle is called what? So I guess there's a hole between the left ventricle and the right ventricle, blood's going. What's that called? <clears throat> and that's called a ventricular septal defect. Well, what if it was going from the left atrium to the right atrium? It's an atrial septal defect, okay? I'll multi-select. What is a sign of detoxicity in infants? Infants. So that's nausea, vomiting, and then the heart rate. They don't see yellow spots. Like the infant gonna say, hey nurse, I'm seeing yellow spots. No, that wouldn't be something you would see. It's that nausea, vomiting, and you'd see the heart rate low. That was a trick question. Jillian's still on fire. What is congestive heart failure? And it's basically a weak heart and it can't pump to whatever reason. And many times in children, it's that some sort of, you know, kink or con congenital defect that causes it. And it just makes fluid build up into the lungs and it can't breathe. How do we treat it? Diuretics and something to keep the heart stronger. And we're gonna do daily weights and we're gonna do a really good INO. Left-sided congestive heart failure causes what? Remember that coarctation, it puts blood that goes back down into the left ventricle, goes back up the right atrium, back into the lungs. That's all left-sided. So you're gonna see all the lung things, the shortness of breath, fluid in the lungs and coughing because all that fluid is collecting in the lungs. Good job. A multi-select. Signs and symptoms of rheumatic fever include
So you're going to see a rash. You're going to see that gait shuffling. But on um, polyarthritis, these nodules on the joint. But again, all of this stuff will go away. And how do we treat rheumatic fever? Well, it was due to a strep infection that wasn't taken care of. So long-term antibiotics for at least a month they'll be given. And then um, we hopefully we don't have any damage to the valves of the heart. After a heart transplant, what is the leading reason children die? And it's rejection, not infection, it's rejection is number one. I'm not saying infection isn't one of them, but rejection is number one. A multi-select. A child's about to have a chest tube removed, what should you do? You know, in cardiac surgery, they come out with two, three, four chest tubes. And, you know, slowly you're going to be removing these things. And they're not fun. You know, I've had uh, worked in the adult uh, open heart unit and removed many a chest tubes with the adults. And they tell me it burns really, really bad. So priority is medicate for pain. That's like your number one. Then explain it to the child on their level. They need to know what's gonna happen. Be honest, if it's gonna hurt, say it'll hurt for a second, but I gave you medicine, it will help and it will go away pretty quick, okay? If you're honest, the child knows what to expect and that child should be sitting up so that if it's with these, it could be into the lungs so that they have the expansion of their uh, lungs. Um, you're not gonna put a, a patient spine. No, you need them sitting up. A child just had abdominal surgery, cannot cough well enough to expectorate secretions. What is your priority? How are you gonna make that child cough to get rid of those secretions? Abdominal surgery, cardiac surgery, doesn't matter. How are you gonna get this child to cough? Because if it hurts, they're not gonna do anything. You're gonna have them do incentive spirometry when they're in pain. Number one, pain medicine. Then they'll do incentive. Then you can get them out of bed. Then you can walk them. You're gonna do nothing unless you give them something for pain. How would you like to have open heart surgery and say, here, do your incentive spirometry and give you nothing for pain? That, no, that will hurt. Be a nice nurse, medicate. An infant three months has a fever of 103.6. What would you medicate the infant with? You don't give any other medicine to an infant ages zero to six months other than Tylenol, acetaminophen for the first six months of life. Then at six months, you may add ibuprofen in. Julian, you keep on fire there. A newborn infant is assessed. The nurse finds very weak lower extremity pulses. What should she assess next? Very weak lower extremity pulses. What do you think that is? And it sounds like a coarctation of the aorta when you see those weak uh, pulses. So what are you gonna do? A four extremity blood pressure. And if it's higher up top, because that's where the blood's flowing, and lower on the bottom, you almost could be guaranteed it's a coarctation of the aorta. A multi-select. A critically ill child is on complete bed rest. What can you do as a nurse to prevent complications? I mean, cardiac children, think about it. They're gonna be on bed rest for a while. They have tubes hanging out of everywhere. So you're gonna use incentive spirometry. Um, you are going to turn this child side to side every two hours. 
Okay. And then we can use blankets and pillows and keep them, you know, comfortable and propped up in the position they want. Um, especially some of the children are more sedated. Elevating the head of bed, it's chest expansion, which can help with the uh, lungs. And of course, incentive spirometry, if they'll do it, if they're old enough. Another multi-select. How can oxygen be delivered that is easiest tolerated and accurately monitored for an infant? You know, there's many methods we can have an oxy hood, we can have a nasal cannula, we can do blow by, we can do simple mask with non rebreathers, endotracheal tubes, what's easiest tolerated and accurately monitored. And the answer, there's two of them here. There's one better than the other, but they're both used. It's the oxy hood. Okay, it's a clear plastic that goes over, we put oxygen in it, and we can monitor exactly how much oxygen is being delivered. And this infant can suck on a pacifier, can suck his fingers, can look around, and it's great. The other thing is a nasal cannula, but you have to tape it on their skin. So it's not as easily tolerated. And they take their fingers and they go and they pull it off pretty easily. You might be reattaching several times, but it does work and you can accurately Blow by, there's no way to, how are you gonna accurately monitor that? You don't know how much is getting to them. And an endotracheal tube, is that easy tolerated? Have you ever been intubated? It is not fun, I have been. You feel like you're choking, gagging. You feel like you can't breathe. It's not nice. A multi-select. What procedure are used to keep the lungs open with a child with cystic fibrosis? Deep breathing, coughing, getting up, getting out of bed, not, not PRN, but three, four times a day, get them up, moving around the hall. You know, I used to do, um, I called 3 p.m. happy hour, where I'd put music on and we would do the YMCA together. And we would sit there and we would, you know, march and we YMCA. And these children thought it was fun. And I even have the parents doing it, the doctors doing it. And what was I doing? I was exercising these children. And of course, myself, of course, who always needed to. So um, you can have fun exercising with these children. It's the way they do it better. Another multi-select. Children with cystic fibrosis require pancreatic enzymes with meals. What teaching should be done? Now, if you've done the case study, this was actually one of those questions. So you should take it right before meals, within 30 minutes before meals. You should sprinkle it if they can't swallow it uh, or the powder, you can have them do it too, but rinse their mouth because it can upset the enamel on the teeth. And again, making sure you get those doses increased as they get older. Probably the most thing that we don't do is increasing doses as they get bigger. What is a cardiac defect when there's no valve between the right atrium and right ventricle? Well, what valve is between the right atrium and ventricle? And that is your tricuspid valve. Very good, good job. Last question. When an infant is breathing fast, tires easily and needs rest periods during feeding, what should you assess? Breathing fast, tires easily and needs rest periods. What do you think is going on there? <clears throat> Something's going on. Um, they don't have the oxygen they need, so they're not getting the energy they need. So they're lethargic, tired, and they're not eating well. It's all about their lungs. 
um, there was something in their lungs that could be going to congestive heart failure. Number three, Brent. Good job, Brent. Number two, Brandy. Doop, doop, doop. Number one, the whole way through, Jillian. Whoop, 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 whoop. Number four, Cody and Jessica. Good job, guys. What I'd like you to do is sign your attestations so that they're done. And anybody have any questions for me, anything they need from me? Thank you guys for hanging in there. I know this is a rough week. So if anybody has any questions when you're done studying, just holler. I, I can help you. Thanks. Thank you. Night. Bye.